Good morning and welcome to Rising. I had so much fun last Monday that I'm back again and I'm joined by Associate Editor at Reason, Liz Wolf. I'm so happy to be here. I'll be filling in for Robbie today and tomorrow. He'll be back on Wednesday. Over the weekend, we saw thousands of advocates for gun control gather in the, at the March for Our Lives rally in Washington, D.C., New York, and other cities across the country. And just yesterday, the Senate announced a bipartisan group of 20 senators have agreed to a proposal to curb gun violence, which means legislation based on this proposal has a good chance of getting 60 votes on the floor. Republican Senator Joanne Cornyn and Democratic Senator Chris Murphy led the pack, with Murphy giving a breakdown in the framework yesterday. Here's what that includes. Major funding to help states pass and implement crisis intervention orders that will allow law enforcement to take weapons away from people. Billions in new funding for mental health and school safety, including money for building mental health clinics. Close the boyfriend loophole so no domestic abuser can buy a gun if they are convicted of domestic abuse. First ever federal law against gun trafficking and straw purchasing. Enhanced background checks for under 21 buyers. Clarification of the laws regarding who needs to register as a licensed gun dealer. Murphy said drafting this law and passing it would not be easy and added that it would be a long time before it gets to the president's desk. President Biden signals his support for the legislation, saying, quote, I want to thank Senator Chris Murphy and the bipartisan group for their gun safety proposal. It does not do everything that I think is needed, but it reflects important steps in the right direction. Let's get this done. The New York Times makes an important point on the deal. Of the 10 senators supporting the proposal, four are leaving Congress at the end of the year, and five are not up for re-election for another four years. Mitt Romney is the only senator who will actually face voters in 2024. So how do you feel about this? I don't feel particularly good about it, frankly. Oh, good. I mean, these are these are relatively marginal changes. These are pretty marginal proposals. And if you actually look at the, the recent awful mass shootings that we dealt with, which, by the way, are not just Uvalde and Buffalo, but also the terrible church shooting in California right. um, that we saw, you know, Taiwanese Americans were attacked. And then I think that same weekend, there were three different shootings uh, in Milwaukee outside of the Bucks game. Yep. Uh, and ultimately, I think 20 people were shot. I don't think anybody died, but like these were all four examples of horrible gun violence happening in very close proximity to one another. When I look at the profiles of those shooters, I don't think that the bipartisan proposal currently being uh, introduced would have actually stopped those people. Thank you. Liz, we are, on, <laughs> we are on the same page. Really? Yes, on we gun are. control? Yes. <laughs> Surprisingly, yes. I, you know, I am in favor of there being some kind of gun regulation in a massive way that prevents the people that we see conducting these kinds of shooting, getting access to these semi-automatic yeah. weapons. But as a criminal defense attorney, I'm always wary of the fact that after these kinds of things, they pass laws that really just lead to more criminalization of the same exact kinds of populations, black and brown people, you know, they, this law specifically, it targets like illegal purchases of guns. Straw purchasing, which is already illegal, might I add? Exa exactly. <laughs> and and also, has nothing to do with these shootings. And actually, on the topic of the Milwaukee shootings, a significant uh, way that so many of those, that the three different shooters there were able to acquire their guns was through straw purchasing. But like, there were already laws on the books that prevented, that exactly. ostensibly prevent that from being possible. Exactly. And really didn't stop them. And a big issue for me with this is the, the juvenile, the background check. So mm -hmm. juvenile's criminal record are sealed. They're sealed yeah. for a reason. They're supposed to be sealed. They're supposed to be expunged. And this only allows for the populations. We already have tens and tens of thousands of black and brown children in schools being arrested, being criminalized. And this really only leads to more criminalization of those populations. And that doesn't really address the major shootings there. So I'm not really a fan. Absolutely. I mean, one thing that I keep coming back to is like with the uh, California church shooting, which by the way, California, not really a state that's known for its lax and lenient <laughs> gun laws. Right. But in that situation, the person who conducted the shooting, which I don't want to, you know, continue to publicize their name. Yeah. He was a licensed security guard who, even if you had really restrictive gun control, he would have had it. He would have had access to it. I believe he was licensed in Nevada. Um, but like, you know, clearly their whatever vetting process they went through, and even in a, a highly restrictive gun control environment, he's the type of person who would continue to have access to this. Right. Um, that's really concerning to me. And then you even look at what types of laws would have possibly prevented the, the Buffalo shooter. New York already has red flag laws New York, on the books. And, and New York so has some of the most stringent gun laws in absolutely. the country. Absolutely. I mean, I know this because I'm trying to get a gun in New York City. And it's not <laughs> I, going so well. I know this because if I represent you and you've got a gun, you're going to jail. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> like, it's a good thing we've, yes. we've linked up. But no, I mean, it's 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 a huge problem. And if you actually look at like the way red flag laws are crafted, which I'm sure you're very familiar with, this is often something that can be used uh, in domestic dispute type situations where a member, you know, uh, somebody in, in another person's family can really uh, 
you know, attempt to weaponize red flag laws exactly. to wrongly revoke people's gun rights exactly. in a situation where perhaps they're not actually a danger to themselves and others, but perhaps it's a spurned spouse or something like that, exactly. or a family member who's trying to do some sort of petty vindictive ploy to get back at them. Yeah. Red flag laws, I think in an ideal world, you know, they would work 100% as intended and they would be uh, written narrow in a, in a very narrow manner and highly specific and enforced well, but like that's not actually the world we live in. Right. What I expect to happen is they, they, they're going after these illegal, they said the flow of illegal guns into states. But the reality is the people are getting their guns, they're getting them from places where they lawfully can get it. And what's really gonna happen is you'll see more criminalization of people for possession laws, black and brown people mm -hmm. in New York City, places where you just can't have any gun at all. These people aren't necessarily committing any crime, but the way our laws are crafted, they're not allowed to have guns, they're not allowed to have anything. So instead of going after the people like who are conducting these Buffalo shooters, who, uh, shootings who will get their guns lawfully and travel to a place like New York City, all that's gonna happen is New York City is just gonna ramp up in places like that, uh, penalizing and criminalizing people that are not conducting these shootings. Yeah, I mean, welcome to the return of stop and frisk, right? Thank you. Who wins? <laughs> Listen, Liz, I'm so glad to see us on the same page this morning. I was thinking about this all night. I mean, what do you think is actually, like, what would actually be a much more viable proposal that would actually prevent these four different examples of shootings that I named? So I think there's not a coincidence that, the new, uh, that America is the largest manufacturer of guns in the first place and we have these gun issues, right? Yeah. I think we should have, um, first of all, I, I have a major issue with this idea that we have a constitutional right to AR-15s. Oh, it's you're an, an you're an anti-Second Amendment guy. No, I'm not oh, okay. an anti. It's not that I'm anti-Second Amendment. No, yeah. it's just that in terms of what the your constitutional rights are, and if you look at this from the nerd law level, it's yeah. just that you don't actually have. To, it doesn't say you have to have these kinds of guns, or that we can't have more stringent regulations, yeah. or that we can't prevent people from getting access to these kinds of weapons. But they seem very hesitant and not poised for us to get some kind of regulation like that. So I don't think they would actually pass anything I want. But I don't think these marginal changes will lead to preventing the kind of mass shootings we're seeing and we want to stop. Absolutely. It feels honestly like a lot of these um, these legislators are really trying to get credit for yes. having done something. And uh, if there's one thing that I'm a little cautious of uh, and, and scared of as a libertarian, it's laws that are hastily passed that are kind of BS laws that don't yes. actually do all that much to target the specific problem. And we have a lot of those. Um, and, and it's done. I think, you know, we, we focus a little bit and the New York Times rightfully pointed out that the Republicans who are in favor of this are not up for re-election. Well, how many of the Democrats are doing this because they are up for re-election and they want to be able to then go back to their constituents and say, look what I did. Look, I made real also, significant change. And also like, true. Is it actually something that will reduce gun violence in these cities? No, I, I don't think so. I, I think what that. happens a lot of times, we see a lot, anytime there are major, major issues and you see from the federal government, they propose these uh, these bills that, you know, they sound nice. In theory, yeah. what they say it's aimed towards doing is good, but people aren't going to look into the actual, you know, nitty gritty and the tedious uh, uh, realities of how it works in application. And I think that's what we're seeing here. It's easy for Biden to say this is the most historic, you know, gun, <laughs> you know, gun reform, gun safety laws passed. I'm like, I'll give you some credit in the fact that you're trying to do something that's better than doing nothing, I suppose. But this doesn't actually go towards that. And in fact, I think what's more likely to happen for Biden and Democrats in the negative is it's going to lead to more criminalization of poor black and brown people. And that's what their base is going to criticize. So I'm not sure if yeah. it's going to accomplish what they want. Oh, absolutely. It's yeah. like we have this inability to notice cause and effect. And yet we, we do this and we do this excavation years down the road where we're like, well, golly, <laughs> this uh, highly restrictive policy where we we empowered the police to uh, surveil people. Uh, hmm, who did it hit? Ooh. Who did it hit super hard? Right, Liz, we're right here. Yeah, I mean, it's not good. It's yes. Not good. And as Congress weighs its own response to mass shootings and gun violence, Uvalde is also having its own reckoning. According to reports, the Uvalde School District announced plans to hire additional officers for the upcoming school year for each of its school campuses. This comes even after reports of the police waiting over an hour to enter the building as kids were trapped inside and killed by the shooter. How is the response to this to hire more cops? It is insane. It is not surprising, but it, it is insane. I've said before that I think this is the clearest demonstration of mm -hmm. police ineptitude. They have, in Uvalde, they have a police department, mm -hmm. a SWAT team. The school <laughs> district has its own police department. <laughs> over 20 different law enforcement agencies showed up to the scene, and they still waited over an hour. Was it really over 20 different Over 20 different law enforcement agencies? agencies. I wrote a Teen Vogue op-ed on the topic. It's astonishing to me that somehow people feel as though the response to this is more policing and more police presence as opposed to, especially because the police department has to some degree stopped cooperating with investigators. They have, they actively said they won't. Yeah, yes. and, and really, I mean, they've embarrassed themselves. They've not covered themselves in gory in any way whatsoever. I mean, any situation where you have people handcuffing parents who are trying to heroically jump into the school to attempt to rescue their kids. Handcuffing, like, arresting, tasing, pepper spraying, <laughs> is, it, is it's, it a shame? It's 
one of the most disturbing and like it legitimately like makes me emotional to think about what yes. would happen if like cops were were physically hindering your ability to go rescue your child yes. and be protective of them and criminalizing you in the moment having yeah. more anger and angst towards you than the shooter they have their yeah. backs turned to the school as they yell at you and they and they uh they threaten to arrest you it's insane honestly i think this is a slap in the face to the people i think an important note is this is a this is a town that respects policing right this is a town that put 40 percent of its uh, uh budget into the police department and here the police that they rely on they were already comfortable they want police at the schools they have this the police that they relied on not only didn't help their children not only didn't save their children but actively stopped them stopped the other agencies that showed up border patrol said they were baffled yeah. they said they were baffled that they wouldn't let them in so i think that this is this is an insult to the parents to to do oh. this for this to be the response to this like Absolutely. if anything heads need to roll i need to hear about people getting fired <laughs> districts getting overturned i need to hear about restructuring not giving more money well, this is the perennial problem with whenever there's a tragedy and in the wake of a tragedy, you pass, you, you do all these uh, hastily considered policy proposals. Yes. The response here is absolutely not to have more cops hired, just as the response to the Parkland shooting was not to uh, empower school resource, resource officers uh, to a greater degree or to, to increase the numbers of SROs that I are in schools. Agree. We see SROs as a significant source of, um, you know, juveniles getting criminal records. Exactly. Uh, and, and it's very unclear to me how people think that that's the appropriate response, when right. in reality, like, this is not, this has not been um, well considered. And ultimately, like, we need much more of an investigation into what actually went wrong 100%. with the cops here. Because, I mean, this type of thing, like, the, the citizens of Uvalde should be able to actually rely on their cops. And exactly. the fact that they betrayed them in the moment when they needed them the absolute most, it's despicable. Exactly. In a logical world, you know, you implement a method. You try something. You can shoot people for trying, right? You try something. You believe in <laughs> policing. You can't shoot people. <laughs> right. right. <laughs> but you, you, you have this method in place. You say, okay, we're going to have three different, three different police departments for this town. We're yeah. going to have all this in place. We're going to put our money here and then when a tragedy actually does happen also important to note everybody involved was trained for school shootings specifically the police departments they've gone through training merely months before right? literally <laughs> literally <laughs> just months January. before the, the students had trained for it the te everybody had trained for it and the only yeah. people um, behaving incompetently are the police right but you have this method in place and then it fails drastically and some other responses Let's double down on that. Let's yeah. let's get more police. More that would really help. Like despite the fact that we had tens and tens and tens and tens of police sitting here chilling, yeah. backs to the school. Yes, let's do that. It's insane. I mean, I I, I do want to give. Uh, do I want to give credit or do I mean it's, it does seem like some reports have emerged where um, they were waiting for higher up instruction and for more tactical gear. And there's also the sort of interesting theory that I've seen um, floated that since this town did have a SWAT department, mm -hmm. there was some sense of, oh, we, the normal cops, ought to be waiting for the SWAT response because SWAT will be the ones that are most adept at handling this. Except that However, would work as a theory yeah. if the yeah. fact that Border Patrol hadn't showed up. So the call, it 1130. Didn't, it didn't work. I it didn't work. I understand the logic, but then there's also this question of like, okay, well, when you give uh, SWAT teams to towns that small, yeah. to what degree are you then uh, disincentivizing actual normal cops from doing their job? Right. That's that, and listen, and, and I would- And they need SWAT teams also. <laughs> that's another thing. I would accept that uh, that rationale or believe it if I didn't feel very much so that it was just uh, an excuse being thrown out now because based on the facts it just doesn't make sense, right? At 11.30 is when they get the 911 call. At 11.31 yeah. is when the resource officer drives past the shooter and follows a teacher. Between yeah. 12 p.m. and 12 p.m., that's when Border Patrol shows up. They are there and 20 different other law enforcement agencies show up and for over an hour the local police would not let them do anything. Yeah. So. It's, they had tactical shields. Border Patrol showed up with tactical shields, and they despicable. still had to wait for an hour. It's really despicable police malfeasance, yes. you know, truly. Um, I'll tell you what's on my radar next.